Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for our April Choices Community of Practice Coffee Chat. The topic for today's coffee chat is advancing equitable access to improved nutrition, evidence, and policy. My name is Molly Garone, and I am a Senior Communications Coordinator for the Choices Project at the Prevention Research Center on Nutrition and Physical Activity at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And as always, it is my pleasure to be moderating today's event. I would like to acknowledge our funders who make this work possible and share that our Choices work and events are only for research and educational purposes. The intention of today's coffee chat is to provide information, tools, and resources to inform and educate. We are not looking to influence any specific legislation. I also want to note that our guest speakers have been invited to share personal perspectives and do not speak on behalf of Harvard. If you are unfamiliar with the Choices Community of Practice, welcome. We are a network that includes people whose work focuses on advancing obesity prevention, healthy eating and active living, and want to learn more about how cost-effectiveness analysis can advance their efforts and address health equity. We aim to support these efforts by providing tools, resources, and trainings. Our coffee chats are unique opportunities to share ideas and enhance connections in an informal setting. Today, we will start by hearing a presentation from our guest speakers, and then we'll open it up for a full group discussion and Q&A. And we encourage you to share any questions or comments in the chat throughout the event today. So for today's coffee chat, we will be having a discussion of both evidence and policy implications for population-wide strategies to promote equitable access to improved nutrition, particularly among children, as highlighted in a recent perspective piece in the New England Journal of Medicine. Our speakers will be sharing specific evidence about cost-effective population-level nutrition policies that have been shown to prevent obesity and improve health equity, as well as offer updates about implementation. Today, we are very excited to be joined first by Sarah Bleich. Dr. Sarah Bleich is the inaugural Vice Provost for Special Projects at Harvard University. She is also a Professor of Public Health Policy at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. With more than 180 peer-reviewed publications, she is a policy expert and researcher who specializes in diet-related diseases, food insecurity, and racial inequality. Prior to this, Dr. Bleich served in the Biden administration as the Director of Nutrition Security and Health Equity at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Dr. Bleich was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2023 and holds a BA in Psychology from Columbia University and a PhD in Health Policy from Harvard University. We are also happy to be joined by a member of our own team, Steve Gortmaker. Dr. Stephen Gortmaker is a professor of the practice of health sociology and director of the Prevention Research Center on Nutrition and Physical Activity, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and he currently directs the Childhood Obesity Intervention Cost Effectiveness Study or Choices Project. So welcome, Sarah and Steve. It's really great to have you both joining us today. I think at this time, I'm going to ask Steve to begin the presentation by helping us understand more about the research that you and the Choices team have done on both effectiveness and cost effectiveness of interventions to prevent obesity. Steve? Uh, thank you, Molly. And thanks, everybody, for being at our coffee chat today. Uh, thanks to our funders, of course, and here they are. Let's go to the next one. I guess first some uh, background, uh, you've probably heard some of this before, but I think it's worthwhile repeating. Um, as you probably know, obesity is at historically high levels in the United States. Uh, our um, research indicates uh, that a, about half of the adult population uh, in the US will have obesity, about a quarter will have some severe obesity by 2030 if we don't change things. Uh, among children, obesity rates are at historically high levels, and our studies predict that a, more, a majority will have obesity by age 35. And at the same time, racial, ethnic, geographic, gender, and income disparities are growing. So we have a lot of work to do. Next slide. Um, our studies indicate that um, with these increases, and these growing rates and disparities are driven by uh, many forces. These include the uh, um, social and economic uh, determinants of health, structural racism, the commercial determinants of health. And these um, forces really um, have altered the global food system. They um, influence where we live, um, 
household income and wealth, the, uh, the foods and beverages uh, that, uh, that we consume. These are powerful forces and difficult to change. That's the background. Next slide. Um, at the Choices Project, we've been interested in changing these relationships. And so we've worked to identify cost-effective preventive strategies. Uh, there are many approaches that you can take, local strategies focused on families, more local environments, uh, clinical treatments. In this um, first part of this talk, I'm going to focus on larger policy changes. Um, we can also, in the chat part of this, talk about smaller policy changes, but uh, these are kind of large um, ones at the level of uh, national and states. Uh, we found that many of these are actually quite low cost effective and sustainable. Uh, we've alert, uh, reviewed a lot of different studies in our search and have identified strategies with good evidence that they can improve nutrition and physical activity, prevent excess weight gain, improve population health, and advance health equity. Uh, the next slide. We've used our choices model to project the future course of the obesity epidemic by evaluating how an identified strategy will impact obesity, healthcare costs, quality adjusted life year outcomes over 10 years. Um, there's very strong evidence linking excess weight gain and future risk of diabetes, heart disease, many cancers, higher healthcare costs, quality adjusted life years. So by preventing this excess weight gain, we have a chance to really improve population health in the future. Uh, next slide. We have plenty of examples of policies with good evidence for effectiveness. You could also uh, visit our National Action Kit, but just two of these are particularly interesting, we think, and they were the focus, along with uh, a couple others of our uh, recent perspective in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, one of these uh, focuses on improvements to the food package in the WIC program, and a second one, our sugar sweetened beverage excise taxes, which have been implemented in a fair number of places right now in the United States and throughout the world, actually. Next slide. The uh, supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children, uh, typically called WIC, um, came up with a food package change in 2009. You can go to the next slide. And um, but this program has about 6 million participants, a third of all infants in the U.S. And in 2009, the allowable food list was updated to support improved nutrition. Um, WIC benefits can only be spent on certain foods. If you go to the next slide. This change in 2009 led to participants purchasing and consuming fewer total calories, less juice, more whole grains, more fruits and vegetables. And we did an analysis uh, before and after this change and found that before this went into effect, um, rates of obesity among children who were two to four year old uh, participating in WIC was increasing each year, basically in every state throughout the United States. Then after this change, we found that the rates of obesity among two, year four, uh, two to four year olds participating in WIC was decreasing. Um, so a nice evidence uh, for effectiveness of this change. Uh, next slide. When we then looked at these results uh, using our choices micro simulation model, we projected that in fact, um, this intervention has saved or prevented about 63,000 cases of child obesity. That's in the final year, about 2019. At an implementation cost per year, about $1.77. And the cost per quality adjusted life year improvement is about $10,600. Uh, there are no set thresholds for what's cost effective, what's not, but people typically will, will, will use numbers like 50 or 100, 50,000 or 100,000, or maybe even 150,000. So 10,600 is quite cost effective according to any of those criteria. 
And perhaps more importantly, because all the cases of obesity prevented are among children from households with low income, uh, this policy change really improved health equity by both income and race ethnicity. And this was uh, discussed in uh, a recent uh, pediatrics paper. Uh, then, next slide. So that's one example. Uh, a second example are uh, sugar sweetened beverage excise taxes. These can happen at state level, not yet, uh, but they have happened at many, at the level of many cities thus far. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, sugary beverage excise taxes would be, um, if it's uh, delivered at the state level, it would be an excise tax assessed on manufacturers, bottlers, and distributors of sugary drinks based on the size of the sugary beverages. It's collected by the state government. Um, well, uh, this would be a volume tax. Sugary drinks, as you probably know, account for about half of the total added sugars in a typical American diet. And more than half of adults and kids consume a sugary drink on any given day. And evaluations of taxes implemented in multiple cities in the U.S., including Berkeley, Oakland, San Francisco, uh, Philadelphia, and Seattle. And Sarah has particular experience with the, the Philadelphia experience. All have indicated effectiveness in reducing sugary beverage sales and consumption. Uh, we did a recent paper that looked at the likely impact of a statewide sugary beverage tax in California. Let's go to the next slide. Using our micro simulation model, we projected that this sort of an intervention strategy, a tax at the state level in California of two cents per ounce, would prevent uh, 266,000 cases of obesity in the final model year at an implementation cost per benefiting person of about nine cents. It would be a cost saving intervention, meaning that it would save more and future healthcare costs than it actually costs to implement. We also projected that there would be greater reductions in obesity prevalence among Black or African American and Hispanic or Latina populations, as well as populations with low household incomes, and therefore be likely to improve health equity by race, ethnicity, and income. And it's also worthwhile noting that this tax would um, lead to um, both lower and higher income populations spending less on sugary beverages after the tax is implemented. Also, outside of this cost effectiveness analysis, this tax is also projected to raise about $1.6 million in state tax revenue annually, and these dollars could be spent on other programs. Uh, next slide. So these are just a couple of examples of cost-effective strategies, policies to improve nutrition environments and health equity in the U.S. Um, well, there are other strategies, um, particularly small P strategies uh, 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 that we could talk about that could be implemented at uh, more local levels. But these are examples at both uh, state and national levels. Wonderful. Thank you, Steve. That was a great overview. I think at this time, I'd like to turn it to Sarah to provide us with an update on the status of these policies now. Thank you so much, Molly. And thank you so much, Steve. For those of you who are joined late, I'm Sarah Bleich and I'm on faculty at the Chan School and I've had the privilege of working closely with the Justice team for many years. I've also had the privilege of serving in government, looking at the Food Nutrition Service at USDA. So I care about these policies very much from a um, federal policy perspective, but also from a research perspective. This is a um, final rule that just came out earlier this month. And what it essentially does is it puts WIC more in line with the dietary guidelines for Americans. And what it does specifically, and perhaps most popular, is that it makes permanent changes that were enacted during the pandemic around the cash value benefit. So originally that was a cash voucher for fruits and vegetables that children could receive $9 a month and moms could receive $11 a month. And those amounts were increased during the pandemic to $26 a month for kids, $47 a month for pregnant and postpartum women, 
and $52 a month for breastfeeding moms. And based on the final rule, that is now permanent. The final rule also reduces the amount of milk that WIC provides and participants can now substitute plant-based and lactose-free products for dairy. They can also increase the amount of yogurt. And this is basically intended to add more choice and flexibility. For whole grain, the final rule requires that breakfast cereals contain 75% whole grain. Just we'll flag that this is lower than the proposed rule requirement, which said that breakfast cereals should be 100% whole grain. And then finally, um, the final rule reduced the amount of juice provided um, because it had increased the amount for fruit and vegetable purchases. If we go to the next slide, please. So the other big thing that has happened is school nutrition standards. So it's been a big month. So also this month, just last week, the final rule on school nutrition standards came out and USDA received over 136,000 comments on the proposed rule. And what this is trying to do is to basically align the school meal standards with the dietary guidelines for Americans, building on the 2010 Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. And you saw some of the results of those evaluations from Steve's presentation. So four things to really understand. First, sugar. For the very first time, schools will have to limit the amount of sugar or added sugar in cereal, yogurt, and flavored milk. And that's starting in the 25, 26 school year. And then there'll be limits on added sugar in addition to those specific foods, no more than 10% of weekly calories can have added sugar beginning in the 27, 28 school year. For um, milk, fat-free and low-fat flavored milk will still be offered in K through 12 schools as long as they meet the limits on added sugar. For sodium, schools will have to reduce sodium in lunches by 15% from current levels and in breakfast by 10% by the 27, 28 school year. Now, based on public comment, this was scaled back from a proposed rule that was suggesting a 30% increase or 30% uh, decrease, excuse me. One of the reasons, incidentally, that Secretary Vilsack said that USDA was unable to make a more meaningful um, cut in SALT was because they were essentially handcuffed by a policy rider in a spending package that Congress approved in March, which limited sodium reduction in school meals. And then for whole grains, there are no changes to the whole grains nutrition requirement for school meals. Schools have to continue to ensure that 80% of the weekly grains offered in the school meal program are primarily whole grain. Next slide, please. So you heard from Steve that there are a number of localities in the United States that have implemented beverage taxes. This is just showing you that visually, the purpose of these taxes generally is to raise revenue and to discourage consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages. These taxes range from one to two cents per ounce. And as Steve mentioned, I've been involved in research in Philadelphia, which is the largest U.S. city to have a beverage tax and the only city that taxes sugary beverages and artificially sweetened beverages. So think Coke and Diet Coke. And we'll just say for context that Philadelphia chose to include artificially sweetened drinks to distribute the tax burden across different income groups. Next slide, please. This is just giving you a little bit more context about the Philadelphia beverage tax. So it's 1.5 cents per ounce, and it was implemented in January of 2017. Next slide, please. So just for context, if there was a 100% path through for a 1.5 cent per ounce tax in Philadelphia, this is by how much the price of typically purchased quantities of various beverages would increase. So what you can see visually, these are relatively large increases in price. Next slide, please. So one big question is, well, how is all the revenue being used? And around the country, there are different uses. But in the context of Philadelphia, there are three primary ways that the revenue generated from the beverage tax is being deployed. One is around creating pre-K slots for young children across Philadelphia for free. Another is around community schools. And the third is green space, parks, and recreation. Next slide, please. So this slide right here is we've done a lot of studies looking at the Philadelphia beverage tax. I want to show you two empirical results that show sustained impact of the taxes. And this, I should say, the study here is, I believe, the first or one of the first to show a sustained impact over time. So um, if you, the going up to that vertical line that is taking you to the implementation date, this is showing you cents per ounce on the vertical. So what we're about to look at is what is the pass through? So if we go to the next slide, please or click over. So in red, you have Philadelphia and orange, you have Baltimore. Next slide, please. 
And what you can see here is that on average, prices increased by a cent. It's a 1.5 cent per ounce tax. So the pass through in Philadelphia was 68%. And I'll just say that that varies depending on the types of stores you're at, big box stores versus smaller stores. But this is generally what we're seeing in Philadelphia. Next slide, please. So then the question comes, okay, well, if prices are going up, what is happening to people's purchases? So again, Philadelphia is in red on the left. In orange, you have Baltimore, the control city without a tax. We also looked at what's happening with the borders around Baltimore and Philadelphia to look at this question of cross-border shopping. And so the vertical for both graphs is volume sales. Next slide, please. So what you can see very clearly in red with that line is that there's a big decline in volume sales in Philadelphia two years post-tax. Next slide, please. And next. And then if you look at the border around Philadelphia and the border around Maryland, you see a little bit of cross-border shopping around um, Philadelphia. Next slide, please. And so um, when you put that together, that 50% decline and that 16% increase in cross-border shopping, what you're left with is a 35% decline in um, volume sales, which is very large relative to other parts of the country where we're seeing declines closer to about 10%. Next slide, please. So if we take a step back and say, well, that's Philadelphia, what is the empirical evidence telling us globally about beverage taxes, of which there are many around the world? There's a recent systematic review and meta-analysis that does a really nice job. And basically what it tells us is that there's pretty conclusive evidence that sugary beverage taxes are associated with higher prices of taxed beverages, lower sales, and that consumers are responding. And so specifically, they found an 82% pass-through rate and they found that there was high sensitive demand for sugary beverages, meaning that small changes in price created a large change in the quantity demanded. And so as you can see here, they found an estimated price elasticity of negative 1.59 for SSB sales. Now, given that many of the sugary beverage taxes to date have been relatively small, so raising prices by maybe around 10% um, and with incomplete pass-through, the average reduction in sales globally is about 15%. And I'll just again flag that in Philadelphia, what we saw over a two year sustained period was 35%. So we're seeing bigger impacts, relatively speaking, in Philadelphia. And then the last thing I'll just say is that these studies of beverage sales are finding no evidence on average of substitution to untaxed beverages. Thank you, you wrapped it up really wonderfully, Sarah. Thank you. And, and thank you, Steve, as well. Thank you both. This has been a really great overview. And I feel like saying, you know, despite all the focus on treatment, especially recently, you've done a really nice job of reminding us that we already have cost-effective, equitable population level solutions that we know can really make a difference. So thank you for, for sharing this great overview. At this time, I'm going to move us into our the Q&A portion of our conversation here. And I'm going to start uh, with a couple questions I already have um, here for you, Sarah. So what is especially notable about the updates to the WIC food package and school meal standards? Yeah, great question. And I just want to say, you know, it's so interesting that many of folks were not aware of some of the research that was shared. I will say I'm someone who sits in the research world and it's very hard for me to stay on top of everything. So I just think it's hard to stay current on everything that's happening. And I really hope that what was shared today is useful for the work that you all are doing. In terms of your question, Molly, what's notable about the changes to the WIC food packages and school nutrition standards? For WIC, I, it's really notable that this these updates have not happened that often. And so this is only the second time in the history of a program that's been around for about five decades. And what both of these updates are trying to do, both in the WIC space and the school meal standard space, is bring them closer in line with the dietary guidelines for Americans, which are, of course, um, evidence-based guidance about how do we make sure that folks can achieve a healthy life. So it's really significant that that's happening. These updates are consistent with this emphasis at USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, around increasing both food insecurity and nutrition security. So nutrition security refers to consistent and equitable access to healthy, safe, and affordable food that is essential to good health and well-being. And there has been a big push during the Biden administration to essentially not just fill up people's fridges with food, 
but fill up people's fridges with food that can help their quality of life. And these two proposed rules are really important steps in that direction. The other thing I would flag, Molly, is just the number of public comments. So the WIC proposed rule received about 17,000 public comments. The school meal standards received 136,000 public comments. These are areas that people care passionately about. And these are topics which really matter because they are reaching tens of millions of children. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you for highlighting the reach there. That is really fantastic to hear. Um, folks, think about if you have questions for our speakers and feel free to enter them in the chat or come off mute. And while you are thinking about that, a uh, question for you, Steve. So will these interventions uh, that you've been sharing about lead to declines in childhood obesity? Uh, good question, Molly. I think the um, interventions that we talked about here definitely will prevent new cases of childhood obesity from occurring. And we have clear evidence of that in the studies. At the same time, child obesity rates are increasing. And what these interventions will do is to slow that level of increase, but they aren't big enough changes to actually turn it around so rates start dropping. So they do prevent uh, cases of obesity, lots of cases of obesity from happening, but, um, but they just slow the rise. And so I think one of the things we have to do is to think of lots of different policy and community strategies that can be combined to together really turn around the changes we've seen. Um, uh, but here we've talked about a few big policy changes. Um, uh, Sarah also talked about improvements to um, school meals, like school lunches and breakfasts. And other uh, research we've done has shown that that's prevented literally hundreds of thousands of cases of child obesity from taking place, uh, from happening, particularly along, among uh, low-income children. But well, there are lots of other strategies uh, that are needed. Um, I guess one of my favorite that's uh, less of a big P, but more of a small P is just improved water availability on school lunch lines. It's been found to prevent cases of obesity and also to have positive health equity impact uh, when it's delivered uh, within public school settings. Great, thank you, Steve. Thanks for clarifying and for highlighting the need for multiple strategies to really make a difference here. I appreciate that. Turning to the chat, uh, we do have kind of a technical question. Do schools have to offer alternatives to milk if the child is lactose intolerant? Could you answer that one, Sarah? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. And I would say in all my time in government, I saw some of the most animated conversations around questions of milk. So you're raising a really excellent question. So as I understand the policies, if a child has a lactose intolerance, school districts have the option to make this accommodation and offer a substitute. This is for children that don't have disabilities, but these substitutions are at the expense of the school district. And if they choose to make substitutions available, they have to make them available for all students when they are requested by their parent or their guardian. So typically there is a cost implication for schools that are looking to offer these types of substitutes. Great, thank you for clarifying, Sarah. A great comment from Susie, particularly as more areas implement universal school meals, updating the nutrition standards is timely. That's a great point. So thank you for mentioning that. Another question here, what would be a policy to improve exercise in schools and in the community? Maybe Steve could comment on that and Sarah, you could add in. Sure, great question. There are lots of different policies and um, interventions. Uh, you can find a couple actually within our National Action Kit um, uh, choices. Um, a couple of those would be uh, active recess or active PE strategies. Uh, uh, particularly active recess has been found to be pretty cost-effective. Another, uh, probably the most 
cost-effective strategy would be movement breaks in the classroom where um, existing teachers can just add some physical activity to the uh, normal classroom activities. All three of those interventions are discussed in the uh, National Action Kit, and you might want to look at those. Great. Thank you, Steve, and thanks for highlighting our National Action Kit. We've uh, put a link in the chat to that tool, so encourage folks to go there, check it out, and as Steve said, you can specifically browse strategies that uh, promote physical activity. Terrific. Can yeah. I add one thing here, Molly, if I may? Of course, Sarah. Yeah, please go ahead. So one thing that I'd love to flag for you all to be thinking about is this space of encouraging healthy eating, physical activity, improved nutrition. This is an area where largely through the work that Steve has led through Choices and others, we have a really good sense of what works. We have a really good sense of what doesn't work so well. It really comes down to political will and awareness about the various options and the trade-offs. So to the point about the National Toolkit, to those of you that are interested in maybe exploring different possibilities, there is a huge amount of digestible information on the Choices website, which really helps you think through, okay, given what's politically possible where I am, here are some options that are supported by the evidence. Because again, this is a space where we really have a good sense of what works. That's such an important point. Thank you, Sarah. Another question in the chat, are there good examples of local strategies to ensure families that are eligible for WIC are actually being enrolled in WIC? Maybe something for you, Sarah? Yeah, this is a great question. So I one important thing just for everyone's context is the WIC program, despite the fact that it is probably the most successful public health program that the federal government runs, the participation rate is not great. So only about 50% of those eligible for WIC are enrolled in the program. And there was a big investment that happened um, through the American Rescue Plan Act of $390 million to both modernize and try to improve enrollment in WIC. So there are a lot of different efforts underway and they include things like diversifying those who are supplying WIC services, using technology to make it easier for people to enroll in the program, increasing awareness about the benefits of the program. And so I think that there are a lot of practical steps that can be taken, but one thing that turns out to be particularly effective is word of mouth. People that are in the program, sharing it with others in the program as sort of trusted ambassadors. This is one of the reasons why a lot of WIC clinics hire former WIC recipients to serve and work in the clinics because there's that strong connection and shared experience. And I will just share with all of you anecdotally, I personally am a WIC baby and they did this great campaign in Baltimore City, which is where I'm from called I am a WIC baby, where they put pictures on the side of public buses, which showed like a baby picture and a current picture. And so my parents who still live there were chasing buses around Baltimore, trying to find these pictures. Um, but it's just a wonderful program. And for those of you that work on the front lines, it looks like many of you do, a big piece of this is really raising awareness and not just telling people about the program, but creating that warm handoff. So here's a person you can speak to that can help you get enrolled. And in some states, there are third parties whose explicit job is to take someone and figure out what are all the nutrition assistance programs for which you are eligible and the social safety net generally, and how do we try to get you plugged in with all of them? Thank you, Sarah. Those are great examples. Certainly that word of mouth piece in particular, I think is great to highlight. So thank you for that. Turning to back to sugary drink excise taxes, a question for you, Steve, do we think there's a possibility that states may enact a sugary drink excise tax? That's a good question. I think the uh, uh, there's still a fair number of cities that could implement taxes. Uh, well, there has uh, some states have uh, preemption. I know Massachusetts has that, where you can't implement a tax at the city level. You need state um, approval to do that. It's called home rule in Massachusetts. 
Um, but in other states, so there are still some cities uh, that could implement uh, taxes, like in California. And I think even in California, it might be possible now to implement more taxes at the city level. But clearly, um, states could implement the taxes. Some states have had taxes. Um, West Virginia had a small tax for a while. Um, and I think uh, states uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic uh, were receiving lots of um, federal dollars to help deal with the pandemic. Um, now that that money is drying up, some states are looking for um, more revenue. And so uh, sugary beverage taxes might come on the agenda again because um, states are starting to feel some fiscal crises. But it's kind of like with the tobacco taxes. I think it took many, many years for people to realize that if you raise the price of tobacco, people will smoke less and that will lead to less death and disability in the future. And I think the same is slowly happening in the world of sugary beverages. It's a, uh, it's a beverage that uh, uh, contributes to excess weight gain and chronic disease. And if you raise the price, you're going to have less of that in the future. And uh, but, but it takes a long time to build the kind of um, uh, political will, as Sarah was saying, to um, change uh, these sorts of things, particularly at the state level. I don't know if you want to talk about this a bit, Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So I'd say one one key thing just to know both about sugary beverage taxes, but then any time that there are changes in the food nutrition policy landscape is this is a giant industry, financially speaking. And so anytime there's a change to the status quo, that's going to create winners and losers. And so we know that interest groups in U.S. politics have an outsized influence in some cases on policy decisions. Beverage taxes are a really good example of very strong industry influence and opposition to additional changes. So it's actually been a while since we've seen a local beverage tax pass. And there's very, very convincing evidence coming out, as I mentioned, out of a systematic review that looks at global evidence out of lots of cities in the U.S. Um, but the empirical evidence is not always enough. You really, to build on Steve's point and to echo his words, you really have to have political will. And it may be that faced with fiscal crises, that sugary beverage taxes become the policy lever that makes sense. Um, but it's really about fitting the option into the available window of opportunity. And it, I think it remains to be seen if we see more beverage taxes passing in the near future. Terrific. Thank you, Steve and Sarah. Steve, did you have another comment? Yeah, just to give an example of how difficult it is to implement things, you know, I think most folks are in agreement that uh, we should offer children um, fresh, safe water in schools. Uh, and why not on the school lunch line? Um, but it takes a lot to actually make that happen. Um, I mean, as you all know, uh, there are problems uh, throughout the United States about lead and pipes and water supplies, and it takes quite a while to deal with that. And then just to figure out how to offer um, water on school lunch lines, who pays for that, uh, takes time and effort to figure out. And again, that's another interesting strategy that's cost effective at preventing obesity. And um, a lot of those details are in the strategy reports of the uh, National Action Kit. Um, I was looking at the uh, question from Rebecca Rhodes also about movement breaks. And I think I actually don't know the answer to that. I think uh, the intervention is typically to have at least one a day, but uh, you could look into the National Action Kit in the strategy report, and you'll find all the uh, evidence cited for those uh, movement breaks uh, with the details about that particular intervention. Great. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Rebecca, for that question. I put a link in the chat to the movement breaks strategy report that Steve was referencing, so you can get some more of those details there. Um, but thank you, Sarah and Steve, for the, the great uh, framing and perspective, particularly on the sugary drink excise tax strategy. That was great to hear. So I think, folks, we are starting to wrap up a little bit here. 
if there are any final questions or comments from the audience, we would love to hear them. We would also love to hear if folks have anything that you're going to take away from today's coffee chat. So maybe something you learned, something that's new to you, a resource or research that you're going to explore after this, we would really love to hear. So please feel free to share in the chat. And maybe one final question, um, and this I think could be for you, maybe Sarah, what role do community-based organizations play in advancing equitable access to improved nutrition, particularly for communities experiencing low income? Yeah, that's a great question. So if I could wave my magic wand and ask nicely for you all to do one thing, if you're working on the front lines and you um, are, are some way connected to the nutrition assistance programs, I would strongly encourage you to urge families to participate. One thing that we know is that with the sunsetting of many of the waivers and flexibilities that were in place during COVID, one key one is continuous Medicaid enrollment. The expectation is that about 15 to 20 million people are going to fall off the Medicaid rolls because continuous enrollment is now over. And a lot of people enter SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, through Medicaid. And we also know that some people enter WIC that way too. And so anything that you can do to urge, smooth, encourage transitions into the federal nutrition assistance programs is going to be really important because they're consistent sources of nutrition and foods for lots of individuals. And they're targeting those that are coming from households with lower income. And so by definition, there is an emphasis there on trying to improve equity. So the single thing I would have you all do is really think about what are the ways within your day-to-day -day lives that you can encourage the customers, the consumers, the individuals you interact with who are eligible for nutrition assistance programs to take part in them. Thank you, Sarah. That's a wonderful call to action for this group. So we appreciate you uh, rounding out our, our discussion and Q&A on, on that note. So I'd like to remind folks, uh, we do have many additional resources available on our Choices website and in our Community of Practice portal. We will pop a link into the chat shortly so you can access that. And we encourage you to register to join and, and browse. I would also like to mention, we do have a little post-event survey that will pop up on your screens when you exit this meeting. So we uh, welcome you to share your feedback and experiences. We also welcome you to short, share any ideas that you have for topics for future coffee chats uh, in, in the chat. So feel free to do so. And just a friendly reminder, we will be sharing a recording from today uh, in our follow-up email and on our website. So you can be on the lookout for that. And finally, as you can see on the screen, I want to invite you all to our next coffee chat. It will be Thursday, May 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern. So really hope folks can join us again. And finally, I want to thank Sarah and Steve for coming on today. We really appreciated having you speak about the research and the uh, evidence around uh, implementation for these great preventive policies. So thank you both so much and wishing everyone a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, everyone. Take care.